Over the past two years, policymakers and health experts have claimed they'll do anything and everything to keep people safe, yet they ignore this one intervention that has been shown to be very effective for reducing disease severity from respiratory pathogens, and that is exercise. In today's session, friends, we're going to talk about the data. Now, we've talked a lot about the protective effects of exercise, metabolically speaking, for reducing all-cause mortality, for preventing dementia and Alzheimer's, but we're going to specifically talk today about the protective effect that exercise exercise offers with regards to severe respiratory infections because ostensibly that's what people care about, right? We want to prevent severe illness. That's what we hear about all the time from the health experts, from the politicians, right? Is preventing severe disease. But why aren't they talking about exercise? The paper that we're going to talk about today from an investigator, David Newman at Appalachian State University. The title is Physical Activity Lowers the Risk for Acute Respiratory Infections. Time for recognition. It's time that we finally acknowledge this stuff. We have the data. This is no longer, just to, lest I remind you, it's not March 2020, friends. We're almost in the 2023 here. We're approaching in North America, the cold and flu season. So when are we going to hear experts start to mention you should walk, you should lift weights, you should go to the gym? Because we can quantify now. This is not speculative. We can quantify the health benefits and we now can quantify the deleterious effects of our own interventions. Remember how safe we thought it was to close the gyms, but yet keep McDonald's open? I mean, what logic was being applied to these policies? I mean, I don't know any, but what's unique here is David C. Newman and other investigators, other people that are well, well versed at analyzing the data, looking at the data, looking at the consequences of lockdowns, looking at the consequences of reducing physical activity by closing parks, beaches, playgrounds, keeping kids out of school. We've seen a 5X increase in obesity in children. There was a recent report that found that the average child runs a mile 90 seconds slower than their parents did at, when you're comparing relative ages, meaning that these children from an exercise perspective, are far beyond where their parents ever were. They're unlikely to regain that. Now, this has consequences with real-life exposure to pathogens that invariably plague humanity. Unfortunately, we can't eradicate all pathogens, which is why we need to improve immune and metabolic resilience by way of exercise. So let's talk about this. I know you get excited about this because you're into health, but we're trying to like nudge our friends and family to say, hey, look, I know you've had 17 booster shots, but you haven't been to the gym since Reagan was president, right? So it's time to get back to the gym, right? So let's quantify this. Let's enumerate the benefits of exercise from a disease severity reduction standpoint, because that's really kind of how the narrative has been shifting, right? We've heard a lot about how in 2021, if you get the vax, you're going to completely block transmission. Anthony Fauci said, it's like a dead end. It's like, hey, whoop. if you get this shot, you're never going to pass it on to someone else. Now, of course, the narrative has shifted and people say, well, it's all about reducing the risk of severe disease, right? So that's what everyone is focused on. Well, you know what reduces the risk of severe disease? It's exercise. Now, you might say, well, Mike, if this was true, the policymakers and the health experts would be all over it. There's only one policymaker, Nayib Bukele, who's the president of El Salvador, is the only policymaker that I'm aware of in the entire world of over 6 billion people that has been actively promoting the, the effect of exercise on a population. Other policymakers and so forth have precluded people from going to gyms, encouraged people to stay in their houses and so forth. So let's enumerate this. Let's talk about this. I know you like facts and I like figures. So do I. Uh, let's get into this because the effect size of exercise is not insignificant. This is not like, well, it's like a 2% difference, so it kind of doesn't matter. We're talking a 45 to up to a 75% relative risk reduction for severe disease, specifically pertaining to COVID-19. Now, again, this is important because this is, as this paper talks about, the currently available vaccines have shown to have reduced effect, effectiveness or efficacy with regards to new variants. So if we're losing efficacy from a disease severity reduction standpoint from the vaccines, shouldn't we then be encouraging other you know, interventions like exercise that can improve the odds of, of not having a severe disease? Again, because the last time I checked, there was a big concern about hospital capacity and supply of you know, healthcare workers in this. Well, then we should be promoting exercise because as the studies show with regards to various respiratory infections, 
High versus lower physical fitness ratings and physical activity levels uh, were associated with a 43 and 46% fewer days with illness symptoms. So essentially what that means is if you compare two groups of people, people that exercise, people that don't exercise, you basically cut the sick days in half almost, 46%. It's not quite half, but it's pretty darn close, okay? And that's just for general cold and flu season. So as employers, we should be encouraging and incentivizing employees to exercise because you cut the sick days in half, which means you get more productivity, you get less loss of work, and, and also hospital uh, insurance claims and, and this and that. But specifically, when it comes to mortality from even influenza, we're going to get to COVID in a minute, but I think it's important because the flu is not going away, right? Just like COVID's not going away, as the CDC finally acknowledged on August 11th of 2022 that, well, you know, we're not going to eradicate this. Sorry, it's here to stay, friends. So I think a nice follow-up to that would be, so exercise, eat real food, focus on sleep, all that, but we haven't heard that anyway. Um, so for example, with regards to mortality reduction as it relates to pneumonia and the common cold, there's a 54% reduction in all-cause mortality and other diseases here, a 50% reduction in cardiovascular disease, 40% reduction in cancer, 53% reduction in diabetes mellitus and so forth. And so again, these are comparing people who exercise compared to people who don't. This literally slashes the relative risk in half. Okay, this is huge. This is far greater. The effect size of exercise is greater than that achieved by some commonly prescribed medications that people have a lifelong prescription for because they believe that it's going to somehow change their, their physiology. But again, it goes back to exercise is medicine. Now, I want to continue on and talk specifically about COVID. Now, what the author here, Newman et al., they talk about some of the studies that we've already reviewed, but since you're here, I'm going to break them down and talk a little bit more about that. But first, friends, I want to welcome you back. These videos, it, it really goes a long way if you hit that like button and share this with a friend so that they get alerted about this. Because as you know, when we're talking about these topics, sometimes the, we get throttled back a little bit on YouTube. So thank you for sharing this as a direct text message. Say, hey, you got to check this out. You got to start moving your body. You got to exercise this fall and winter if you're worried about cold and flu season. Also, as you know, exercise is so important as we've been talking about, which is why I want to help you get more mileage from your exercise sessions. So the Electrolyte 6 by Myoscience do just that. You get creatine, you get real salt, you get Albion chelated minerals, you get taurine, you get all the nutrients to help you have a great workout, help you to stay hydrated during that exercise session. So I encourage you to check out some of the hundreds of different reviews that real customers have left over at myoscience.com. You have a 30-day money-back guarantee. This can help you pre-workout or intra-workout and also recover from your sauna sessions. Again, the URL to check it out, links will be below. A novel pre and post or intra workout uh, formulation. It's an electrolyte with creatine and taurine. Check it out over at myoscience.com. The code to save is podcast at checkout. So all that will be linked below. But let's specifically get into the data with regards to reducing disease severity from COVID-19 as it pertains to exercise. Fascinating stuff here. A retrospective analysis of a large group of adults in South Africa was confirmed with confirmed COVID-19 showed that meeting physical activity guidelines was associated with a 34 to 42% lower risk for severe outcomes when compared to physically inactive participants. Now, this one we talked a lot about in 2021. This was Kaiser Permanente's data set. Lest I remind you, it only included 48,000 people. Okay, only 48,000, right? We're supposed to follow the science, but I guess that 48,000 doesn't matter. But it's kind of unique. What this study showed is that out of the 48,000 people in this data set, the investigators found that a 73% to 149% elevated risk for severe outcomes in those who are physically inactive compared to physically active. Okay, a 73% up to 149% increased risk if you're physically inactive compared to physically active when it comes to severity of COVID-19. I don't know about you, but that's a pretty big number. And this is not a small data set, 48,000 some odd subjects. Okay, we also talked about this study before, but again, this was a study in South Korean adults. And what they found is that 
An observational study of South Korean adults showed that those who met their moderate to vigorous physical activity guidelines had a 58 to 76% lower risk for severe outcomes of COVID-19, as well as a 15% reduction in risk for testing positive for the virus altogether. Friends, I don't know about you, but some of the numbers that you see thrown around on the, on the television for the interventions that are supposedly going to reduce the risk of severe disease, exercise is actually better than those interventions, okay? Now, I know the, uh, the gods at these tech companies don't like us to talk about this for whatever reason, but this is a piece of low-hanging fruit that we all have access to. Now, even if you're, you want to get vaccinated and boosted and quad boosted and new bivalent boosted, by all means, knock yourself out because guess what? Exercise actually makes those interventions more effective. And that, I think, I firmly believe that is part of the, the loss of efficacy that we're noticing on a population level is there wasn't the prescriptive recommendation that, hey, when you get your immunization, you should also be exercising in the weeks leading up to that and after because it actually makes your immune system more competent and able to produce better post-immunization antibodies and T-cell immunity after you receive the, that intervention. I, I firmly believe that in, in the U.S. in particular, that's a reason for the, the quick reduction in efficacy. It's not so much the variance, it's, it's that that recommendation wasn't there. That's speculation. We don't have data to confirm that. But the point here that they finish up on, the articles, Newman et al. Actually, there's one more point here from the, the UK Biostatistics Database. There's a 58% reduction in severe COVID-19 outcomes when comparing the most healthy compared to the least healthy participants. And these outcomes, the proxies that they included here, were sedentary behavior, physical activity, sleep, diet, quality, alcohol intake, and smoking status. So lifestyle accounts uh, in, independently of other variables for a 58%, almost 60% shift in the relative risk of getting severely ill versus not. And again, it, I bring this back because we've heard over and over from the health experts that they're doing every single thing they can. They will close your business. They'll lock you in your house. They'll take your kid out of school, but they won't recommend you stop smoking. They don't encourage you or incentivize you to go to the gym or start walking or reduce your stress or not go crush alcohol or be one of the 500 million cars in Chick-fil-A every single day. Why aren't they recommending these things? Because I honestly believe that people are motivated enough based upon the fear that if they heard it from the right mediums that they would actually make these changes. And so I, I, I get passionate about this because I want people to be healthy. I don't like landing in America after being in another country and seeing all of the morbidly obese people here that I did not see in Canada or that I did not see in Latin America because that's the sad reality for those of you that participate in international travel. It is shocking when you come back in America and you see the rampant obesity and its consequences of increased chronic disease. These people can't be happy and healthy and functioning and living a, a vital life life of meaning and purpose when they're that unhealthy and they just need to hear the right message from the right person. And, and I don't think they're hearing it from the CNNs and the, the mainstream media. I know they're not hearing it. In conclusion, we now have the data that closing gyms, parks, schools, playgrounds, and canceling sports was a terrible idea and had a lot of side effects. And as the authors go on to say, Data collected during the COVID-19 pandemic reveal that highly stringent governmental containment measures were a barrier to physical activity. Oh, who would have known? I mean, closing parks like caused people to be more sedentary? That's shocking. I would have never suspected that. What about you? Especially for those who needed it most, right? So all these people said, just buy a Peloton. Like, come on, buy a Peloton. It's no big deal. It's only like five grand. What? Buy a Tesla too while you're at it. Okay, some of these people... Many of these people living in apartment complexes who are working in cafes, who are single parents, they can't just buy a Peloton. So they rely upon parks and things that had caution tape preventing them from going there. So there's consequences to myopic thinking. That's the important thing. We need to be better thinkers, okay? Many of these people that depended upon parks and YMCAs and fitness centers that were no longer able to access them have chronic health problems that were worsened by those myopic ways of thinking. The author goes on to say, during the early part of the pandemic, many areas of the country closed gyms, sports clubs, rehabilitation centers, and swimming pools. Some local public health agencies even shut down beaches, golf courses, walking, running, and mountain bike trails. 
Because of course you catch a respiratory virus on a beach, right? That's like the worst place to ever be during cold and flu season. Never go to the beach. I mean, it's like, this is where all pestilence happens, of course, is at the beach. Um, but we have since learned that during the COVID-19 pandemic, in retrospect, that uh, we should be at attempting to improve physical activity levels, is what these individuals are saying here, by keeping outdoor exercise facilities open and facilitating home-based activity programs. And we now know that there is a cost and consequence associated with our myopic attempt to to potentially eradicate the virus that had already infiltrated the entire country by way of international travel. So um, I point this out because you can tell it's, I get a little excited about this because I received a lot of hate mail. I received a lot of comments, a lot of direct messages from people who thought that I was going, that I was participating and they accused me of participating in genocide for promoting activity. And I know people in my life who literally would go to the Super Bowl, but they canceled their gym membership, right? They went to the Super Bowl. Like, I guess the Super Bowl is safe, but you, but it, when you go to the gym and there's only like 20 people at any given time working out, you're, you're going to get a really severe illness at a gym. But when you go to the Super Bowl with, you know, tens of thousands, it's totally safe. So again, we've made these crazy decisions. People have it and there's, it, it's fraught with logical inconsistency. And it's not, we're not focusing as a collective on the things that actually matter. And we now have the data. We have enumerated the health benefits up to like, as I mentioned, some of the studies is 73% risk reduction in severe COVID-19. And the problem now when looking at Omicron and comparing exercise and so forth, it's, it gets a little murky because you have so many people that have been vaccinated and boosted and it's not, the population is, is a very diverse population. Immunologically speaking, some people have natural immunity, some people don't. So What's nice about the early data from 2020 is you're looking largely at an unvaccinated population and comparing pre-pandemic physical activity levels and using that as, as the variables that you're looking at. So it's, it's definitely different now. So, but the point here is, and we'll finish up off this image here, figure four, it shows the viral load of individuals who are physically fit versus who are not. And again, for all the people that said, if you go to the gym, you're going to spread the virus and you're going to like kill grandma. Well, people who are physically fit carry less virus. They're less infectious than people who are not. So to think that you can go to the restaurant and not catch a pathogen so long as you wear a mask while you're traveling to the table, but you take it off of the table, but then to also at the same time think that the gym is a place where pestilence you know, originates. It, again, there's just logical inconsistency here. And we now know the data here is, friends, physically fit people are less infectious. They carry less viral load. And so therefore, they're less likely to have severe illness. The take-home message is stay active. That's the bottom line. Hopefully, we never have to have this conversation of should we close gyms or not? Should we close saunas? Should we cancel sports? No, no, no. That is essential, as is social connections. You need, you need social connections, friends. You need to be able to see faces, not just like the eyes, right? You need to see the whole face, uh, and you need to move your body. So hopefully, we can do the right thing going forward. Hopefully, we can make people healthy again, physically active again. That would be nice. And we depend upon you to do that. So thank you for sharing this video with a friend who you know needs to exercise more, needs to hear this from a different lens. And thanks for sharing this article. And thank you, David Newman, for sharing this. It's fantastic. I hope more and more investigators continue to talk about this because it's time we recognize the protective effects of exercise. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for sharing this video. We'll catch you all on a future one down the road. Bye now.